So the Rare Genomes Project is uh, one of the Broad Institute's direct to family kind of research projects. And ours, this particular project is focused on um, using research-based genomic sequencing to try to find the genetic diagnosis for undiagnosed families. And it may seem a little odd to be giving a talk. I'm not sure where the rest of you kind of are coming from, but the nature of, of the CAT6 Foundation, I think, is um, having a genetic diagnosis. Um, but um, our goal is to try to help people find you, I think, for lack of a better word, or to help families across the board who don't quite carry a genetic diagnosis yet. So I'm not sure if any of your members fall into that category or um, or anything like that. But um, in my experience in talking with lots of families is that in addition to whatever disease or gene specific foundation or organization they be, may be members to, um, they often have local connections and families that they know through shared resources or appointments or physicians or therapies um, that they're in contact with. So I guess if you, in listening to this, think of those other families too that you might know that might be struggling to achieve a genetic diagnosis. Um, we're not just strictly built um, around um, around this particular diagnosis. Um, I want to thank Natasha and um, the foundation for inviting us and the rare is one. Um, the rare is one groups from the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation um, for helping make uh, this possible. Um, so a little bit about who we are. So we are um, a diverse group of professionals who comprise individuals with a clinical background like geneticists and neonatologists, neurologists, genetic counselors like myself, um, as well as kind of the behind the scenes people like software engineers, um, bioinformatics people, um, and the analysts who actually look at the sequencing data that we generate and try to make connections with the symptoms and the families that we study. Um, and uh, that is picture pre-COVID when we actually could get all up in each other's business. <laughs> but um, but uh, that's the order of magnitude or the general scope of the size of our group. And let me see. Um, so, you know, our larger goals within this research study are to increase access to genomic sequencing, given the barriers to um, access through insurance coverage, or maybe limitations on certain types of genetic tests that people can get covered. Um, and our goal is to find the genetic diagnosis for undiagnosed families. Um, our processes and our systems are specifically designed around people who have um, a medical condition due to a singular gene in the body that's at the root of it, um, as opposed to many of the more common diseases like heart disease and diabetes that are due to a combination of genetic factors and environmental factors that together in a stew kind of cause the disease. We're focused on things like cats, the cat sixes. Um, we do rely pretty heavily on, because we're so focused on these rare conditions, it's not the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and cystic fibrosis per se, but just trying to help people that are kind of not in those broad groups. Um, we do rely quite a bit on sharing information broadly um, with other researchers um, and kind of crowdsourcing and power and numbers types of approach. Um, we do have a return of results arm of the study if we find anything that we think is plausibly related to the condition um, that they applied for. Um, and we do engage directly with participants in terms of we don't require a doctor to refer families. We don't require a letter of support or anything like that. Families who think that they are eligible can just apply directly to us. Um, preaching to the choir here a little bit, but I think um, every, you know, part of the motivation for doing this is we realize well that every diagnosis can make a huge difference. And um, with the name and kind of a, um, a reason and an explanation comes from, you know, from that comes the opportunity to ask questions like, what does the future hold? Um, ending that, why did this happen? Or what is this what is this entity um, and what can we expect? Um, another one is a big one is finding groups like yours um, and being able to belong to and find a community um, of people facing similar types of questions and challenges, but also a group of people that are motivated and moving towards the same direction, which really is how do we optimize medical care? Is there a treatment or cure that we can work towards? Um, and how do we help by participating in research like clinical trials or registries? I know, um, I know there's a registry that you guys run. Um, 
so with all of that power, some of the reasons why patients are undiagnosed is that, um, you know, sometimes conditions aren't genetic at the root of it. So that's one cause, but some of these other challenges, we are suited to help and we're not the end all be all, but um, we can help with access in terms of, we do not require any prior testing for families to be eligible to participate. So families who face a barrier to access due to insurance coverage that we are removing that barrier. Um, there are analytical challenges. So when we do a genetic sequence on somebody, there are millions of DNA differences from them compared to a stranger or one of us on the study staff. Um, and it is a little bit kind of like finding Waldo of how do you figure out which of those individual, which one of those individual factors is the one that's at the root of um, a root of the condition. Um, and Technical challenges can also be an explanation in terms of are you reusing the right technology to find that type of genetic change or that genetic mutation that's causing disease. Um, so um, we do whole genome sequencing in our study, um, which like every, every technique has its own Achilles heel or gaps in coverage for lack of a better word. Um, but, we do, um, but we do try to attack it from a couple different testing strategies when we can. Um, the eligibility criteria for fam families is pretty broad in terms of um, families just have to have a suspected single gene disorder. Some of the typical hallmarks are early onset, multi-system disease, delays in growth or development, especially of neuro growth and development. Um, they have to live in the United States, be able to be consented in English or Spanish, and ideally have a medical provider who on the back end, when we have a result to return, we could work with, although we do have a backup for families where that's a challenge. Um, what we're not equipped to do, though, is perform follow-up studies to help determine whether a variant of uncertain significance that may have been identified is truly causal. A lot of times what's required to do that are wet lab experiments that we don't have the capability to do within our lab. Um, we try to help people, if we identify a VUS through our process, we try to help families find those other labs that can do that. Um, but we don't accept families who come in knowing that that's the case because that's not um, that's not our strength. Um, and, and I just, as I was kind of refreshing my memory and kind of reading up on the different clinical, the spectrum of disease, I guess, and all the different clinical features is that the stuff that is found and identified in people with CAT6 related disease, are that group of stuff is all suspicious for a single gene cause. And so people with those symptoms or where that is a potential um, would be eligible for our study. By and large, I suppose there's some exceptions. Um, Brian's going to go into more details, but um, this is a very high level, like we start at recruitment through talking with groups like you today um, by word of mouth. So telling a friend or somebody that you know, and by clinical providers being aware of us when they see families. Um, enrollment is entirely remote. Even before COVID, it was entirely remote. Brian can talk more about that. We do the analysis in-house in Boston. Um, and then we do have a return of results arm when we, um, when we have something that we think is plausibly related to disease. But Brian's gonna go into more detail. Um, about that right now. Thanks, Melanie. Um, and so for, from a family's perspective, uh, really the process starts off, uh, they can either apply online or submit an application by phone. And I already mentioned that no prior genetic testing is required. You don't need a doctor's referral to get involved. You really can just apply um, directly. And then we do have a bit of a review process just to do that evaluation that it is suspected to be monogenic, uh, that you are genetically undiagnosed. Uh, so afterwards, if exited, we do invite um, affected individuals, um, biological parents and any other affected relatives to enroll. That's not required to participate in the study, um, but that is who we would like to collect um, and then with the, all of them, we go through a consent process um, and do prefer to collect blood samples from those individuals. Um, all of this is done locally. Uh, we set mail the kits and they're mailed back to our lab where they're submitted for the whole genome sequencing. Um, and meanwhile, we work on collecting medical records for, for symptomatic family members, especially as uh, really the, most of the information we get is from the initial application. And as mentioned, that's all just family submitted. 
Um, so later on, we do work on collecting medical records for those that would, it would be relevant to collect from. Um, and then eventually, after all the work is done, uh, on the back end, uh, we do work with a provider uh, to hopefully um, confirm any result that we do find. Uh, at that point, it, the result goes to that local provider to, to return with the family. So next slide. And so kind of what we've been able to do so far, the study did kind of start towards the end of 2017 and has been continually enrolling till now. Um, and so at least as of February, uh, we've been able to enroll individuals uh, from all 50 states, including DC and Puerto Rico. Uh, we definitely do lean kind of urban populations, just those with access to either academic centers or those with access to genetics overall. Um, pretty even split male and female. Uh, we do have a wide, wide range of ages. Um, there, there really isn't an age requirement at all. Um, and these kind of numbers are always something that we're always trying to improve uh, by doing outreach with groups like yours and just doing direct outreach. Um, but we do kind of hit across the country and, and are working to reach more people. Next slide. And so kind of with all of that, what we've been able to see so far uh, for, for really just under 50% uh, of families that have kind of gone through analysis, have had all their samples collected. We have some level of, of finding something that we believe may play a role in the disease or might play a role. Um, it's possible that maybe some more concrete evidence would be helpful to further evaluate what's going on. Um, we do, again, whole genome sequencing kind of standardly for everybody. Uh, but we do employ other methods as they are available, and we do have an iterative approach to this. Um, so for, for those that have gone through analysis and maybe those remain under analysis, we do go back to them uh, over time and just see if, if there's been any improvements in the science or the technology uh, that could have um, really helped us get there. Next slide. And so, of course, with all of this, we do participate in some data sharing. Uh, data sharing really stems from our experience with novel gene discovery uh, and new disease, new gene disease associations. Uh, we share genome and phenotype data. It's all de-identified um, through controlled access databases, um, really all at the goal of helping us and helping advance scientific knowledge. Um, so we really use these avenues uh, to also lean on subject matter experts uh, when we do have a candidate variant or when we are looking at a gene of interest to really get their input um, as well. Next slide. Um, and so that really kind of sums up the project and, and what we're doing here uh, are our information's at the top. And we also do want to plug um, that we do work with Gabrielle Lemire, who is, will be speaking at your conference on June 4th. Um, so I believe uh, she'll, she'll be mainly talking about review of the CAT6B disorders, uh, but we'll, I think we'll be plugging us as well. And we do work with her quite closely. Um, so just wanna give a shout out to her. And we're happy to take any questions or comments. And we're, if we have other materials, if you're interested in seeing those, um, we're happy to, to meet with and, and kind of about 